Hello, everyone. This is David Brandt, a producer on Problem Solved. You're about to hear our season two finale of the podcast. Since the launch of Problem Solved, we've had more than 20,000 total downloads across 100 countries. So we want to thank everyone for listening and sharing our episodes. We recently wrapped the virtual IISE Annual Conference and Expo 2021, where we met several attendees who were discovering the podcast for the first time. So if this is your first downloaded episode, then we welcome you and hope you'll continue to indulge us in the future. And speaking of the future, IISE is looking forward to seeing its members and other event attendees live in the next round of our conferences, starting this fall with the Lean Six Sigma and Data Science Conference 2021, live in Atlanta this September. You can learn more about this event and register at IISE.org slash Lean Six Sigma. And more information will be available soon about the Healthcare Systems Process Improvement Conference, the Applied Ergonomics Conference, and next year's annual conference, which is set for Seattle. In the meantime, we hope your summer is much better this time around than it was a year ago, and we'll be back with new guests and topics for Season 3 starting in late August. For now, here's the Season 2 finale of Problem Solved. This is Problem Solved, the IISE podcast, where we talk to industrial and systems engineers about their work, ideas, and solutions. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Problem Solved, the IISE podcast. I'm David Brandt, digital strategist for IISE. Today, we're going to talk about personal finance. It's not the topic you were expecting. It's a topic that's maybe a little bit outside our range of uh, previous episodes. But this one is actually a little bit personal and a little bit professional. To start, I'm going to give everybody a brief story. And I've brought this up, of course, in past episodes. Uh, I'm a cancer survivor. And as I was trying to get my life and my career back on track after that experience, uh, we happened to publish an article in what was called Industrial Engineer Magazine at the time. You know it today as ISE Magazine. The article was called Graduate Finances. The subhead, of course, being for IE starting out in the world, your first six months paved the way to your future. And it was an article that was largely focused on personal finance, but it came from the voice of an industrial engineer. That industrial engineer is Kevin Drevick, our guest today. Kevin is currently the director of industrial engineering at NFI Industries. He previously worked in engineering and management roles for LG Electronics, Dorman Products, and Office Depot. He received a bachelor's degree in engineering as a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and a master's degree in engineering management from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He's been an IISC member for 25 years, serving in several volunteer leadership roles, including as the regional director for chapters in the U.S. Eastern region. And to my point, Kevin, I needed this article and the time that it came (laughs) so that I could get (laughs) myself back on track. And it just couldn't have come at a better time for me. So, again, this is an article that stuck with me. This article, again, was published in May 2011. We're in 2021 now. So many of the principles and ideas that you talked about in this article, I feel still ring true today. And that's why I wanted to bring it to the podcast. So, Kevin, welcome to Problem Solved. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Um, Really enjoyed the podcast and uh, looking forward to talking with you. Excellent. Bear in mind to our listeners that neither Kevin or myself are investment experts or personal finance gurus or anything of that nature. Again, we're speaking from experience. You initially wrote it in early 2011. I know this is asking a lot because it was so long ago now, but this was just a few years after the punishing fiscal bomb that was the Great Recession. What prompted you to give this advice to young engineers starting out at that time? As you said from my history, I've been a professional for 25 years. My local chapter would go to uh, all the various colleges in our area and present to the students, have discussions with the students, give some guidance to the students, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've spoken at regional conferences. I've spoken at the national conference before. Um, And what I found was a lot of engineers didn't really have a lot of knowledge, a lot of the young ones, about what it was going to be like, you know, their first job and what some of the basic finances they were going to have. Um, And I find that's true, not just IIE students, but, you know, college students all around. They really don't understand when they walk out of the world and it kind of smacks them in the face that, hey, I've suddenly I've got a paycheck coming in. I've got money coming in. I've got responsibilities and et cetera, et cetera. What do I do? So I got a lot of questions in reference to that. And I thought it would be a good article 
uh, to publish that I, um, I've been in, interested in investing in savings for retirement. Um, I got really, really interested in the year 2000 after the dot-com bust. Um, and so when 2008, 2009 hit, um, I saw a lot of people sort of jumping out of the market and being afraid and being scared, not knowing what to do. And I thought it was a good time to, to put that information out there. Well, and I'll admit, I was one of those people who was completely turned away after 08, 09, thinking, okay, I can't trust the market. I can't trust our system. Clearly something's wrong, but it's such a large entity and it's such a large function of our economy that I guess I got a little bit more conservative in my thinking as I've gotten older and realized, you know what, I need to figure out a way to build wealth, not necessarily to try to become rich, but just to you know be able to afford these things I'm going to need later in life. And that's something that I think... Uh, people are worried about more today under our current circumstances, that, of course, being the pandemic and its effects uh, on our economy. Back to the article, you open up with day one, which typically involves an introduction meeting with a company's human resources representative. Obviously, you and I have been through this more than once in our careers, uh, but for our younger audience who may be entering the real world very soon after listening to this, what should they expect to learn from that initial HR meeting? Now, are we talking just the the finance side of it, or are we talking the whole big HR meeting? Well, let's talk about all of it, but um, specifically the finance side. Just as you described, they're entering the real world, and it's uh, you know their their exposure. It just becomes one thing after the other right away, and a lot of students aren't fully prepared to handle all the information and all the change that's coming at them at once. So, talk through, I guess, generally that first day experience. What would you recommend that they be on the lookout for? Okay, so your first day, you're obviously, you know, and this is a very generic type of discussion. You're going to want to make a good impression when you go in there. You want to gather a lot of information in there. Um, you're not going to be required to make a lot of HR decisions initially. And a lot of companies nowadays, they're actually sending that stuff out in advance. If your hiring day is next Monday, you know, a week beforehand, you're getting information in the mail and uh, or email uh, with a lot of the data, here's the benefits package, here's all the rest sort of stuff. Usually you're not expected to make a lot of decisions as far as benefits or whatever. Um, your first day, you're going to you know, get that information. So when you first walk in the door, obviously you're probably going to be given, okay, you're, you're going to meet with so-and-so, he's going to be your new boss, he's going to walk you around. Um, you can expect probably human resources will, will get you to begin with uh, for about an hour uh, they'll give you more information. They'll also talk about some of the policies and procedures and et cetera, et cetera. And then what they'll do is they'll then turn you over to the person who's probably going to be your boss um, or whatever. Um, and your company will, your boss will walk you in. Chances are he'll say, this is where you're going to be working, your desk or your cubicle or your office or whatever. Um, he'll show you around, you know, where the bathroom is, where the copy machine is, where the coffee machine is, where you can go for lunch, you know, where, where the break rooms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they'll sit down and probably give you some idea of what's expected of you for the first 30, 60, 90 days. Um, after that, he'll probably turn you over to somebody else, a peer, or someone who's going to be more along the lines of someone you can go to on a daily basis to say, hey, how do I do this? Or, hey, my, my computer's not printing to the printer. What's going on here? Or, hey, I need to have this issue. Who do I go talk to? Um, that's going to be more like, you know, like I said, a mentor peer type of thing. Uh, and then that person's going to probably walk you around, introduce you to some folks. Um, I would say one of the things you want to find out is who's the senior admin in the area. Uh, that, that administrative assistant can make or break you in a lot of cases, and they'll help you out a lot in a lot of cases. So that's something else to do. Um, as far as the finance side of the house for the HR, you know, some of the things you want to look for um, in there is uh, the benefits that they're going to have, not just the medical benefits, but, you know, insurance, legal, if there are some education benefits, some, you know, whatever, whatever there. Um, and then from there, you're going to have to eventually make some decisions, which I'm sure we'll discuss some more in some of the uh, other questions coming up. To your point with the uh, medical information and, and the coverage information that uh, is just put in front of them, IISE was my third employer. So I had already been through a couple rounds of being you know young and in my 20s thinking, ah, OK, I get it. Money comes out of my check, goes toward my medical coverage. Yeah, I get it. very passive attitude about it. Uh, after cancer, I clearly woke up. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll admit, I, I just wasn't paying as close attention uh, before that time. Uh, between my youthful ignorance and uh, newspaper veterans, which is the industry I started out in, newspaper veterans telling me that the insurance covered, uh, quote, next to nothing, end quote, uh, I lost sight of its value. 
obviously my experience has changed that. What would you suggest engineers ask HR about day one regarding their medical coverage specifically? What information do they need to know? Um, okay, for for you know the medical side of the house, some of the stuff they're gonna lie is there's usually there's a variety of different plans. They each have their strengths and they each have their weaknesses. A lot depends on your personal situation. Um, one of the first things is is do you have a family? Do you have a spouse? Do you have kids? In that sort of situation, uh, you're gonna probably want to have something with a low deductible. The way medical typically works is is you usually have a variety of different plans. And the, some of the stuff you have to decide on is, is okay, certain plans have what's called a high deductible, which is basically money you have to pay out of pocket out of your own checking account before the medical will take it in. And then they have ones with low deductibles where you don't have to pay as much, um, you know, and the medical will pick up more, but those are usually more expensive, more comes out of your paycheck. So in the end, when the smoke clears, you sort of have to make a decision. Okay, am I in a situation where I've got a lot of tests? I got to go to the doctor a lot. I've got a you know a, a newborn or anything along those lines. Then uh, then that's the situation where if you've got something like that, you probably want a a low deductible and and, and cheaper rates for things. But if you're by yourself, if you're on your own and you're young and you're reasonably healthy, maybe what you do is you say, I want a higher deductible. I'm willing to, if I ever get sick, to pay some more out of my checking account. But in the meantime, I'm going to pay less for uh, less for medical bills. One of the things that I like that's come out is they have uh, something called an HSA or a health savings account. Um, not to be confused with an FSA. I'll give that a second. But the HSA, what that allows you to do, it usually has a high deductible plan. In other words, you're going to pay a lot to begin with from, you know, for, for a lot of your stuff. But what it lets you do is take money out of your account without paying taxes on it. So it's sort of like one of those 401ks type things. So you're not paying taxes on that money and it sits in that account. And then you can use that account to pay your medical bills. And if you don't use it at the end of the year, well, you just keep it. You haven't paid taxes on it. And then the next year you get more money in the HSA and more, and it just keeps accumulating. And you could hold on to that money for 10, 20, 30. You can, you could be, you could hold on to it for 50 to 60 years and use it to pay medical bills when you're in your 70s. And you can then and you could also invest that money like in the stock market or something like that. So it grows faster. So I think for a lot of people, a lot of young students, if they're single, reasonably healthy, HSA is definitely an, an excellent opportunity because it's got a high deductible. You're not going to pay as much. You're going to be able to basically take that money and not have to pay taxes on it. You can use it for medical later. They do have something called an FSA that they'll also do, which is a, another savings account. The problem with the F is in Foxtrot SA is you have to use that money by the end of the year. And so the end result with that is, is okay, let's say I have $500 in it. It comes October and I've only used 200 bucks on it because I'm young and healthy student engineer. What do I use the other 300 bucks for? And if I don't use it, guess what? At the end of the year, it goes, it disappears, it's gone. You've never used it, never had the opportunity for it. So I'm not a big fan of the FSA, but I am a big fan of the HSA for young students. You know, I was earning, gosh, when I started out, I think I was earning somewhere around $750 a paycheck. Wasn't much. I was a copy desk uh, editor, worked the night shift, wasn't the guy on the street, wasn't you know, the guy giving orders, it was really just uh, that's that's an entry level job more than most others in newspapers. I didn't realize I had already started working professionally full time before I even finished my degree. The problem was, is I didn't really consider the foresight of what was to come, as we've already kind of hinted at all the expenses and the uh, adulthood switch that happens, uh, particularly when it comes to student loans and living expenses, uh, because you better believe that my folks uh, weren't all that cool about me living at home after graduation. So, <laughs> uh, so what was your experience like as you were coming into adulthood and suddenly trying to learn your new job as well as set yourself up for a financial future? And in what ways did you feel like you got it right early on and where did you make your biggest errors? Okay. So to start off with, that was a bit of an anomaly to start when I graduated from college because I graduated and went straight into the military for five years. The military, basically, you had a guaranteed paycheck. It wasn't that big of a paycheck, but uh, and you had government housing and government medical. And so you sort of, for the first five years, I think you sort of have to take that off the table for me. Uh, at the end of five years, at the age of 27, I got out with my wife. And um, that's when we really had to start looking at, you know, the, the budgets and all the other stuff like that. Suddenly, we had to start paying for housing. Suddenly, we had to start paying for a medical. Suddenly, we had to start paying for a bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff that 
the the military had taken care of in that regard. So one of the benefits in that regard, though, was is we had five years together. We had a reasonable budget, a reasonable standard of living that we created. So at least we had some of the basics pretty much taken care of. Um, I think one of the things that always shocks people is how much it costs to get a place to live. If you're not staying with your parents, um, in some cases, let's just okay. The, the the rule of thumb for my article was it was no, nothing more than about a third of your paycheck should go to um, should go to you know your living expenses. So if you're making fifty, you know, let's just go back to you the seven hundred fifty dollars a week. That's maybe twenty thousand dollars a year, roughly. So a third of that, six thousand six hundred bucks. So that means you shouldn't be spending more than five hundred to five hundred and fifty bucks a month on where you live. Uh, if you want to basically have a, a decent chance of, of a budget, well, 550 bucks in mo- in a lot of places doesn't get you much of anything. I don't think it even gets a lot of cases a one bedroom apartment. So suddenly no, you're looking I can't at- think I can't think of anywhere in the in the country right now, in a, at least in a metro area in which that's going to be the case. You're lucky to cover half in some cases. So now you got to look at roommates. You got to look at all the, a variety of other stuff in that regard, or or other or other less expensive ways. Maybe you know renting a room or something along those lines in order to basically make it work to start with. Um, and so, uh, you know, we basically, for us, and I think we started out at about 40% was for our living things. Cause we just, it was just, we lived in an expensive part of the country. Um, and my wife had to find a job after we moved initially, cause we, we found a job for me. I got a job and then my wife had to find her. So that was a bit of a pinch. Um, so as far as um, some of the, 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 the failures to begin with, one of the big ones I'll, I'll, start off and, and say simply is, is what, as far as the 401 case that the companies I had, all I did was I paid to the match. In other words, my company matched me at the, the first 5% of what I, you know, I put in, I paid to 5% and I never increased it. So for the first, like, I would say nine years after I got out, I really did not invest much money other than, you know, that matching amount in the 401k, hardly anything in an IRA, hardly anything anywhere else. And so I lost a good nine years of you know, opportunity when I did it. So it, like I said, it really wasn't until 2000 that uh, I really started getting interested in that and uh, started burning a hole and maxing stuff out and really, really investing. Gotcha. So don't make that mistake. Start to begin with. Uh, one of the things I always show to the students is, is if, if somebody starts right as they graduate at the age of 22 and puts in $5,000 a year. Yeah. It's the equivalent of me putting in $14,000 a year starting at age 36. It ends up being like a 1.2, 1.3 million I've got to put in more than two and a half times what they're putting in on a daily basis. We're going to be underscoring that through this interview, but don't wait. That's the lesson already. Spoiler alert. Speaking of spoiler alerts, I should say, let's go ahead and spoil it for these graduates who are going to discover that when they're told they're being paid a certain amount a year, that's clearly not what they're actually going to be taking home. What insights would you give young people entering the American workforce to understand about deductions removed from their pay? Where is that money going? You know, depending on how much they make, they, they're going to find that, you know, 20 percent or more gets subtracted from their pay, just gone. Um, start off with, uh, roughly seven and a half percent goes to social security and Medicare. Um, your, your employer is also paying another equivalent about seven and a half percent. It's possible that number may go up in the next uh, 10 years or so, uh, because the social security is a little bit underfunded. I do want to point out as far as social security uh, goes, um, that is a tax. A lot of people say, well, I'm paying into this, so I should get money out. You know, the way that the Supreme Court back in the 1930s allowed it to be legal was is it is a tax. You're basically being taxed to pay for your parents' Social Security. So don't ever think that you've got a, ba- a bucket of money sitting over there. It's it's not that way. Um, you've got taxes for federal, state and local. One thing you whenever you're looking at a job, find out where that job's located. The federal taxes you can't get away from. But if you go to certain states like Tennessee or Florida they don't have a state income tax. And so the result is you're not having to pay that versus I live in New Jersey. New Jersey's is, is as high as 7%. California is even higher than that. So if you get in certain states, you're paying that. Um, in addition, cities have it. Like right across the river from where I live is Philadelphia. Philadelphia's got about a 5 or 6% tax on their income. Excuse me, I think it's like about, like about a 4%. But it's, I mean, you can have a significant chunk of your money just because the company chooses to locate in that location as opposed to somewhere else. 
And it may be the difference between, you know, that company or a different company as far as the pay you get. Um, you also get money taken out a lot of times for unemployment. That's to cover for you. You're paying into the unemployment fund so that if you ever have to collect unemployment, you get it paid. There's other, you know, stuff that's very state dependent. My state, New Jersey's got a family medical leave money you've got to pay into, a disability you got to pay into, workforce development, it's got to get paid into. Plus, then there's your medical your dental, your vision, all the other fun stuff like that. Um, depending on your company, they're going to take, you know, anywhere between 50 to 70% of your medical costs they'll pay, but then you got to pay, you know, 30% or more. Um, and for a lot of folks who go work for the federal government or the state governments or whatever, uh, you know, their medical and, ben- and dental is paid for supposedly. Um, but in a lot of cases, they're not earning as much from their wage. So it's the equivalent of, it's basically you know, that money gets, that gets sucked up. The combination of career success that I've had, but also the bad luck on the health front and general uh, poor decision making that I've also made, and I will own up to every bit of it, uh, (laughs) among other factors, has led me to lead a lifestyle rooted around minimalism. Not in the live like a hermit context that most people believe that to be, uh, but rather to develop an ability to determine what has the most value and what has no value. And it's become evident to me over my adult life that budgets, even simple ones drawn on a napkin, can go a long way in showing me just where I stand and when it comes to income and expenses. What budget methods would you recommend to graduating students? Methods such as the 60% rule or the 50, 20, 30 model? First of all, I wanted to congratulate on the whole minimalism thing. It's, it's, I'm very impressed that it's starting to take hold a lot more in the country. Um, we've got such a consumer-driven culture. Um, everybody should be warned out that at the, from the beginning that just about everything that they interact with, be it the TV shows, the movies, the stuff on their phone, it's all designed to get you to spend money. So if you can step away from that and say, you know, Hey, do I really need this thing? That's going to go a long way to making you a lot happier in life. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of discipline. I will say that (laughs) that's, those are two key things. You're constantly being bombarded with images and scenes where if I just had this, I'd be so much happier or that person so much better than me because they have this and it's not, it's not true. Um, as far as budgeting goes, uh, I'm a big fan of the whole pay yourself first concept. The idea being is, um, and I think I'm trying to remember exactly where I got it. There's a there's a, an old parable that somebody wrote called "The Richest Man in Babylon," um, which you can you can find all over the place. But the big thing for that was is that 10 percent of what you make is yours to keep. Was the the general concept of the parable, which is basically, hey, if I make you know 100 bucks, 10 bucks of that is mine. The other 90, I may have to spend on living expenses. I may have to use, you know, pay for food and all this, but 10 bucks of that is mine. I should be able to keep that. Um, and so my big thought was, is that before I do anything, I say, okay, what's, what, you know, what are my, you know, savings goals here? Is the minimum, if you've got, a, if your company has a 401k or your nonprofit has a 403b, they usually match something. Usually they say, okay, we're going to match. Three percent or the first six percent you put into, well, you, you bang, that's free money. That's basically if I put in six bucks, they're going to give me three bucks for free. As a minimum, you should do that. Okay, and usually what I'll try to do is I say, okay, get you know, figure out, okay, I'm going to ten percent of my money I'm going to keep. The other ninety percent I'm going to spend on you know food and clothing and how where I live and my you know my transportation and all the rest. But as a minimum, ten percent of what the heck I get. You know, if I if I make a thousand bucks this month, a hundred bucks of that's going to go either to foreign care or something. And then you, you you design your budget around some of the. I think the artist got some simple rules as far as like I said, one third of your money, no more than one third for where you live, um, a certain amount for food. You know, you got to pay for the medical and all the rest of other stuff like that. And you start off with the ten percent. And then one of the things I always suggest to people is every year you're going to get a pay raise. Sometimes it may be just a three percent pay raise. Sometimes you may switch jobs and get a 15% pay raise. But as a minimum, my suggestion is you get that 3% pay raise, take 2%, add it on, you know, spend more money, but take 1% every year and bump that number up. So if you start off at 10% at age 22, age 23, you get a pay raise. Now you're saving, you're, you're saving 11%. Next year, now you're saving 12. Next year, you're saving 30. You get all the way up to 20%. You're doing really, you're doing so you like, you're in the top 10% of the people in the country. If you're saving 20% and you can do that religiously for the next, you know, 20, 30 years, um, you can do it. Um, And then whatever you have left over, you're going to, you're going to basically spend. Now, 
unless there's a real disaster, the first couple of years are going to be your tightest. There, that's the one you're going to have your hardest time making budgets and making stuff in it. Don't go into debt. Don't buy 10 tons of credit card debt. But basically, every pay raise every year after that, it's going to get a little bit easier, a little bit easier, and a little bit easier. And so by the time you probably hit 30, you're going to be probably in pretty good shape. I would suggest to you that you, the 20s are a key time. You are determining what your lifestyle is going to be. You're going to determining the kind of cars you let you drive, the kind of furniture you have, the kind of clothes you wear. And if you end up saying, well, I'm going to live the high style, the, the, the rich person style, um, the, the Kardashian, I may be dating myself. I'm Kim Kardashian style or whatever. I think Excuse they're me. still relevant. I think they're still there. <laughs> but uh, you're going to, you're going to have to support that with your money. But if you live a much more, as you said, minimalist lifestyle where, okay, I'm, these things are important to me and I will spend money on this. The rest of this stuff is not that important. I'm not going to spend a lot of money on that sort of thing. If you can basically set your standards to a certain level, then from that moment on, every year you're going to make more money and you'll suddenly discover that well, I have a boatload of extra money hanging around. What the heck? For anyone who has been out of college in the past 20 years, uh, we've witnessed a lot of events that have made an impact on the national or global economy. And I've, we've already brought up a couple uh, ones that come to mind for me uh, since I graduated from college in about 2003, uh, a couple years earlier, the September 11th attacks, uh, the housing market crash in 08 uh, and our current pandemic. These type of events, though, have made investing a shaky proposition for me personally, and I've done more of it in the last several years, albeit conservatively. And I'm fairly certain, Kevin, that you're not one to recommend investing in Bitcoin or super risky ventures like that. Um, again, not experts, but, you know, read the news and you'll see. <laughs> but, uh, what factors do you recommend young graduates consider when it comes to investing? Uh, because that's eventually going to be an option for them. It's not necessarily something I, I think you would agree that they should be doing right out the gate. They have the, the day one meeting and then they get their first paycheck and they shouldn't be thinking immediately, oh, I'm going to throw, you know, 25% into Apple. Should they start investing in stocks and bonds right out the gate or focus on their 401ks or maybe Roth IRAs or anything deemed low risk? Okay. So to start off with, I would say that the one big advantage that these that young engineers have coming out of school is they have time and time heals a lot of wounds. There's a lot of people who invested money in the, the late 1990s that saw it get burned in the dot coms. And then that they basically, you know, they invested more money in the, in the aughts and all of a sudden 2008 came along and they got burned in 2008. But the big thing that they did is if they just let it sit there, if you put money in like the S and P 500, which is an index of the 500, you know, biggest stocks in the United States. And you often see on the financial things, the S and P 500, and they, they rate how the, the stock market's doing off that. If you left it in there, I think it was trading at around 800 or 900 or something like that when I first got started. Okay, it's it's trading around what is about 3600 now, so I've I've quadrupled my money if all I did was just sit. Okay? The biggest problem I see a lot of cases is people get emotional with their money. They suddenly see it drop like a stone, you know, in 2008 it dropped almost 50%. You got 10,000 bucks in the market and all of a sudden you see it go to 5,000 oh, in, in in the span of like 2 months, you go, "Ah, but there's a, there's an investing philosophy called buy and hold. Um, and it's been around since the United States first started, for gosh sakes. The idea is, is you basically buy the stuff and you hold on to it and it'll get, and, and, and it basically grows over time and it will, it will have ups, it will have downs, um, but it'll grow. And so, and there's, there's never been a 20 year time period in the United States history that the stock market has not made money. Now, there's been one year time periods where it's crashed and burned like nobody's business. There was the Great Depression when basically in 1929 it went down. It didn't recover for like 15 years to where it was. OK, but if you look at it over a 20 year time span, it basically recovered and kept going up. OK, the dot com burned by 2007. It was already well above where it was before when the dot com burned and the 2008 it blew. It's already almost double what it was, you know, in, in you know, in, in 2008. So it, if you've got a long time horizon and these young students do, they, I would invest and I would invest. Now we, we talk about, you know, investing off on the side, but when you're getting a 401k or an IRA, you're already investing. 
you're already putting money aside. You may put it in savings. You may put it in bonds. I would suggest if you're just a young, you know, young person coming out of college, you're 22 years old, I would go 100% stocks. I would buy an index fund. And what an index fund or an index ETF or anything like that. What that is, is, is that basically they have studied over and over and over. And what it comes down to is, is that for extended periods of time, no financial advisor beats the market. You can get the smartest, you know, investment advisor on the planet, you know, uh, you know, Warren Buffett type person. And you could basically say, okay, that person's stock picks, he's, he's awesome. But over a 10 year time period, just the market by itself will beat that person. Okay. And so if you, and what they have is they have a thing called an index fund or an index ETF, which is another form of a financial instrument. And all it is, it just buys all 500 stocks of the S and P 500, let's say. And so every, Every day that goes up, it goes down, but over time it averages at about 10%. And as long as you just leave it there and don't panic and sell it, because the biggest problem a lot of people have is, is they just go, ah, they panic, they sell it all. And that's usually right then is right when the market is the lowest it's going to be. And then it starts recovering from that moment on. And then they basically wait and wait and wait and wait while it recovers and gets over where it was. And then finally they get back in again. Best thing in the world. If you, if I was 22 years old again, I would take my money, put it in an S&P 500 index fund, 100%, and I would just dump money in there like a 401k every month over and over and over again and just let it sit. And then when and, and, and when it burns down, because it will, let it sit and it'll come back up again and it'll go be even higher. And then you'll be like, holy cow, look, at that. I have all this money. Where'd that all come from? <laughs> you know? Solid advice for consistency and sustainability, I think. Yeah. <laughs> In the original article, you did list about a dozen sources for further reading and education on money and personal finance, uh, but it's been a long decade since Graduate Finance is first published. Uh, we've already talked a little bit before this interview about resources you have. Uh, what are your new favorite digital resources like websites or podcasts that have a better reach for this younger generation? Uh, and are there any books or authors still that you'd recommend as well? There's a there's a, a movement in the financial community called the FIRE movement. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. Uh, financial independence, retire early. Yeah. Yes. Um, it really started blooming about five years ago. But the, the, the general concept behind it was, is you had people whose idea was, okay, I'm going to live a more minimalist lifestyle. I'm going to only live on 50% of what I make. And I'm going to take the other 50% um, and I'm going to basically invest it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to basically just do that. And that way, and then every time I get a pay raise, I'll just, I'll spend 50% of that and I'll invest the other 50% of it in there. Um, and the idea being is, is that over within a period of time, you can accumulate enough money and enough investments that that money will now start throwing off dividends and returns, et cetera, et cetera, to the point where it will start making as much money as you are already spending with that 50%. And then at a certain period of time, you'll be able to basically say, hey, wait a second, this is throwing off as much money as I'm currently making at my job. I don't need to work anymore. And so you're suddenly, you are financially independent. Now, the, the, the retire early part is kind of the, the, the funny, what the, the, their idea in a lot of cases that is not necessarily to retire and sit on a beach, but basically to say, okay, I can now work on a job that I enjoy. Um, I can work at, I can basically, if my boss is a real jerk, I can basically say, I'm going to walk off and leave. Or, you know, if, if there's another opportunity that may not pay as much, but it's going to be a lot more fun work that I enjoy more, I can pursue that. Or I can take, you know, six months off or a year off and I can travel around the world. And what it is, is that's popped up in the last five years. It's gotten really, really big. And there's a lot of good advice, a lot of good websites. Um, I've got a couple that I could shoot you. We can put in the show notes as far as their aggregators. They basically have a, you know, they, they pull the best articles, the best blog postings on a daily and weekly basis. And they post them up there and you can read through them. Um, you got to take everything with a grain of salt because everyone there is in a lot of cases, they're not professionals. But they're gonna you're you're gonna probably be able to find people that 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 are close to um, your lifestyle or your interests or the sort of or, or in your area um, and the sort of stuff that they like to do and um, that I think you know it, it's it's a small group I mean it's it, it, again it goes in the whole minimalist lifestyle and the whole idea of I'm I would much rather um, spend less money today so that at a certain point in time in five years in the future or something along those lines. Um, 
I can be free. There's a there's a website called um, Mr. Money Mustache. He was one of the, he's one of the grandfathers of this whole thing, and, and he's got an interesting chart that he's got on there, in which it basically shows that whatever percentage of your your salary that you save, this is how many years it's going to take before you're financially independent. So if you save ten percent of your salary, it goes out to like. 46 or so, you know, 46 years later, you'll be financially independent. If you say 15%, if you say 20%, he goes all the way up to 90% where you're saving 90% of your salary and living on 10%. And, and in two years, you're financially independent. You know, it all depends on what you're willing to do um, and how much, and how much you're capable of doing. You know, there's people in there. I know that, that you know, one of the things they do is everyone talks about living with your parents. You know, folks used to live with their parents all the day. It's only the, like the last, since like the 1970s, 1960s and 70s, that people actually got used to the idea of moving out the minute you graduated from college. Most folks live with their parents. My wife lived with her parents for the two years before we got married. I think my father practices too much banjo uh, for me to <laughs> possibly consider that option. Um, he's found a lot of things to do in his retirement and, you know, he's he's earned it and God bless him. But um, I think if I was in there for a day and he was practicing the banjo, uh, that would be the end of that experiment. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Hi, Dad, by the way, if you're listening, uh, moving on. As you wrote in your article, ISC students graduate with a strong foundation of functional knowledge applicable to their careers, uh, the wide variety of careers that they serve. Certainly in my experience working with industrial and systems engineers over the years for IISE, uh, their ability to research and investigate, to analyze data, et cetera. Should colleges and universities provide more opportunities or add emphasis on personal finance education? Or are there even opportunities within the fundamentals of industrial engineering for parallel teaching? The context of this being think Daniel and Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid. Wax on, wax off. Taught him everything he needed to know. <laughs> well, I would say yes, they should offer more opportunities. Um, as far as the Mr. Miyagi thing, you could uh, you could phrase some of the you know the the, the problems that we do. You know, dealing with percentages, um, dealing with growth, and dealing with that sort of stuff. You could phrase some of those as far as financial ones go. Um, I would like to see more you know a personal finance course as an option, not necessarily mandatory. I'm, you know, I'm more of a libertarian. I don't like the idea of mandating that. Um, any opportunity to get some additional studies, possibly having various groups or clubs or something along those lines. Um, I think a lot of the issue, though, is, is that for a lot of young folks, they just don't think about personal finance. A lot of families don't talk about personal finance. Um, Money is often considered you know, dirty in there. And I think a lot of students don't realize the sudden explosion of money they're going to get exposed to. A lot of, you know, I, 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 I always laugh when I talk to the students that I talk, I speak with um, is they're going to love being an adult. You know, they've been told all this time, ah, being an adult sucks and ah, you know, it's so much better. And all these movies where <laughs> people go back to their high school or their college times or whatever. And it's like being an adult is great. And one of the great things is you're going to suddenly have a large amount of money suddenly throw your way. You're going to be like, holy cow, I've got a paycheck and it's that many zeros. What the heck? Now, granted, you pay, got to pay taxes and stuff on that. But suddenly you're going to be faced with a lot of adult decisions you got to make. Up until when they graduate, a lot of times they just haven't been exposed to that and they just can't conceive of that. That's one of the reasons why I wrote the article was, is you guys need to start thinking about this right as you get going. Well, I hope the class of 2021 and other young professionals got some lessons from this conversation uh, that they will consider applying sooner rather than later. And let Kevin and I both emphasize sooner, <laughs> sooner <laughs> rather than later, uh, as it will likely make your adulthood just a bit less stressful. Listeners to this podcast can find a link to the May 2011 article, Graduate Finances, available in the show notes, as well as some other resources Kevin's been kind enough to provide to us. And that will be uh, available to you right now as you listen to this on our podcast website at podcast.iise.org. Good luck, everyone, and maybe put off buying the PlayStation 5 for just a little while longer. Uh, Kevin, <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time to revisit your ideas and the ongoing value they've provided to me and I hope many others in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had a great time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Problem Solved, the IISC podcast, a production of the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers in Metro Atlanta. This podcast is produced by David Brandt, Keith Albertson, and Michael Hughes, and edited by David Brandt. 
You can listen to all episodes of Problem Solved and learn about sponsorship opportunities by visiting our website, podcast.iise.org. You can also learn more about IISE at the Institute's website, www.iise.org. 